Most of you have, have uh, read about Carl Jung's work and are probably waiting in eager anticipation to, to hear his most up-to-date results. So we're actually going to have Carl talk first. Um, Carl is a professor of pathology and laboratory medicine at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, he's uh, always been an extraordinary uh, scientist. He's been a good friend. Um, I had an interesting conversation with Carl, uh, I don't know, maybe 18 months ago or so, and he told me that you know, he really wanted to move things from the laboratory into the clinic and really make a difference for patients. And, and I think that we're all witnessing um, uh, that happening. And so it's a real pleasure to introduce uh, Carl, who's going to talk about engineered T-cells with CARs for hematologic malignancies. Carl? Um, well, thanks, Dan, um, uh, you know, for organizing this. And, and uh, um, I want to thank uh, Don Thomas. You know, I was able to train with him and, and with Stan. We had an amazing environment in Seattle back in the 80s uh, to witness bone marrow transplant. And um, so uh, what I'm going to present are results from two ongoing trials, one being in uh, patients with CLL led by David Porter at the University of Pennsylvania and the other by Stephen Grupp at uh, Children's Hospital in pediatric uh, ALL. And uh, both uh, I and the people in my lab have conflicts uh, uh, as this technology has been licensed by Novartis. And... Um, and, and his funding support is, comes from a variety of uh, organizations, including now uh, Novartis. Um, so chimeric antigen receptors, as Stan mentioned, have, have been something that's been actually developed in laboratories and not the pharmaceutical industry um, and are, are poised now to enter the, the realm of allogeneic and autologous bone marrow transplantation. Engineered T cells really have, at this point, two applications, one being an approach to overcome tolerance where the affinity of T-cell receptors is low or, or lacking because the repertoire is not there. So that involves introduction of, of MHC-restricted T-cell receptors into T-cells, creating then a bispecific T-cell, um, one where it would have its endogenous receptor and then the other, a, uh, the engineered receptor, and uh, it would then be MHC-restricted. The other approach is, is so-called chimeric antigen receptors or CARs uh, and also sometimes referred to as T-bodies. And this is an approach to introduce an antibody-like uh, recognition domain into T-cells, again then making a bispecific receptor uh, and T-cell, but then in this case uh, employing signaling domains uh, inside that are linked to the antibody and therefore creating a, 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 a T cell that's not MHC restricted for a target that's on the surface of, 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 the, of the T cell uh, and tumor cell. So both approaches are in the clinic now and have, have quite promising results. Uh, t today I'll show results on our ongoing trials in hemologic malignancies, but there are a number of trials around the country now showing that both of these approaches are feasible using allogeneic or autologous approaches um, to redirect T cells and overcome tumor tolerance. So CARs were um, really first conceived by Zella Geshar at the Weizmann Institute uh, about two decades ago um, and now have entered the clinic initially in, in HIV and then in patients with cancer. And the first trial results in cancer are shown here. And they were in patients with solid tumors uh, in the first trial, ovarian cancer targeting uh, the folate receptor 1-alpha, and then the second trial targeting uh, renal cell carcinoma and the um, uh, uh, um, uh, carboxyanhydrase 9 target that's on um, renal cell carcinoma. Both of these trials showed safety but not, did not find anti-tumor efficacy. And we now know in retrospect it's because that the engineered T cells did not engraft and, and, and proliferate in the patients. So we've worked on uh, making antigen uh, specific T cells this way by engineering them and culturing them in vitro for about 10 days using uh, paramagnetic beads that bind uh, the CD3 molecule, which is part of the T cell receptor, and CD28. Um, these beads, which are iron colored, uh, are removed at the end of the culture process uh, using magnetic or paramagnetic uh, um, fields to uh, leave the T cells behind and the um, beads retained, and then the T cells are cryopreserved and fused in patients. So, so we began treating CAR patients in 1998 in a trial sponsored by uh, Cell Genesis, and um, and then began uh, treating CAR patients with T cells in, in in 2010. And I'll show those results today. 
So the, the initial trials were, were with a first generation car that has uh, a single chain antibody and then the zeta chain only signaling domain. And this has been referred to as so-called a classic car now. And it, these were initially used uh, for safety reasons uh, because uh, it's the simplest signaling domain and it mimics what the T cell receptor does. So-called second generation cars now are in the clinic at, at a variety of places and um, um, have other signaling domains to enhance signaling and cell proliferation of the T cells. And third generation so-called muscle cars are now being tested at several um, institutions uh, to even enhance this further. So, so there's both ability to enhance the exercise of the signaling domain and, and uh, the hinge domains as well as the signaling domains. Uh, and then this T cell that these cores are expressed in. Um, a number of trials have now been published. Uh, in, and interestingly, they're all from the U.S. at this point um, in patients treated with um, cars using either allogeneic or autologous cells that, uh, and for patients with B cell malignancies. Um, the first trial is at the Fred Hutchinson targeting CD20 using the rituximab uh, antibody a, as a targeting domain and then uh, with a single chain zeta domain. Um, and then now a number of trials are targeting either C19 or 20 and using uh, varying signaling domains, uh, these so-called second generation cars. And our trial that I'll show is, is here is, and targeted the form BB and zeta as a, the co-stimulating domain. The reason we have used form BB in this second generation car approach as shown here where um, we, we tested all possible combinations of the uh, form BB molecule, which is part of the TNF family, uh, receptor family, and CD28, another co-stimulatory domain, um, and cycling molecule. And when these are expressed on T cells, we found bright expression in all cases. So this is staining for the antibody on the surface of T cells. And then exponential division of the cells when they're activated through their T cell receptor. However, the, the ones that had form BB have some constitutive activity in that even though they haven't seen their antigen, which would be CD19, the T cells continue to proli uh, proliferate for about three weeks before they rest. So they do eventually stop proliferating, but they have a larger proliferative burst um, in, in vitro than, um, than, than their other uh, signaling domains, which had either Zeta or CD28. So the initial trial uh, was to test this for potential safety and efficacy in patients uh, with refractory and relapsed CLL. So patients have to have uh, two previous FDA-approved therapies for CLL and not um, be eligible for an allogeneic transplant to get on this protocol. At MD Anderson, this is a survival curve of CLL, which is long uh, at, at time of diagnosis. But if you look at patients who have failed two uh, therapies, uh, including fludarabine, then they have a, a short survival. And these are the patients who are uh, eligible for the protocol. The protocol uh, design is shown here in this cartoon where um, the Form BB car was expressed in a lentiviral vector, a third generation vector using a constitutive promoter so that the car is expressed at all times on the T cells. Uh, the cells were activated from patients after an apheresis uh, and in vitro uh, expanded for 10 days and then uh, transduced with a car and then given to patients uh, as shown here below following um, a dealer's choice chemotherapy regimen that was given a week prior to T-cell infusion. So we re reported the first three patients in August of 2011 um, and, and then now have, have treated 12 patients on this protocol, and, and I'll show those results. So at this point, uh, nine out of the 12 patients have had responses. Ten have had CLL, and I'll present those results, and then two have had uh, pediatric ALL. Um, and so these are ongoing trials uh, that in a number of centers have seen responses that I'm going to show, but they're all done at boutique settings in cancer centers. Uh, the real issue now is how to scale this up to make it applicable um, at multiple uh, other cancer centers, and that's, that's an issue that now the pharmaceutical and biotechnology industry is dealing with is how to make cultures in a robotic fashion and not being done as we do it currently with um, scientists in a laboratory that have PhD qualifications. So our initial uh, patients in CLL are shown here. They um, had advanced 
CLL, three of them of the ten had uh, P53 deletions or 17P on, on their karyotype and uh, a median of five prior regimens. Um, and, and the dose range that we've given these patients have been broad, but on average about 100 million cars have been infused. Our pediatric trial, we use dosing on a uh, per kilogram basis in adults. It's a flat dosing regimen. And um, the median follow-up is short at, uh, at eight months, but the, the earliest patients are out now past two and a half years. And um, the results uh, for those patients are shown here. In light blue, it's for CLL and for pediatric ALL and down at the bottom. So um, the, the, the results have been that most patients have had responses. Um, and they have not had relapses uh, in the case of CLL. So that has been a surprise that the CD19 positive malignancies have not relapsed in, in, in spite of the fact that this is a, a therapy that's targeted only one antigen. I'll show that, that that contrasts to our results in pediatric ALL in a moment. Um, and the results then have been durable out past two years in the initial patients treated and much shorter in, in some of the earlier patients. The bone marrow is easiest to assess for response, as well as blood, and, and lymph nodes are harder to stat, uh, assess uh, whether residual adenopathy re, re, uh, represents any residual tumor or whether it's uh, 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 inflammatory uh, cells. Um, and so we have not had biopsies of lymph nodes to, to assess that in patients. The summary of the first three patients is shown here where um, they all had refractory uh, CLL. Two of them had P53 deletion, which unusual uh, uh, portends a pro poor prognosis to chemotherapy. And they had large tumor burden um, because they were on phase one protocols. So these were not MRD patients, but up to seven pounds of tumor could be documented by calculating uh, the lymphadenopathy, hepatosplenum, megalin, bone marrow burdens of tumor. And we could show then that there was actual expansion of these cars, as I'll uh, show in a moment, so that they proliferated in the patient and then uh, were able to, um, on a, an effector to target ratio, um, uh, eliminate more than 1,000 tumor cells for each infused cell. So these are self-replicating cells. And that's one of the advantages of of chimeric antigen receptor cells is they can replicate and expand in the patient. In a way, it's similar to a donor lymphocyte infusion, except here there's no allogeneic effects. And in this case, they're en engineered to be C19 specific. So as I mentioned, the, the, re the remissions have been durable to date in the adults with CLL. The pharmacokinetics of the, of the CARs are shown here by using either PCR or staining uh, for the antibody on the surface of the cells in patients. And they had a, a three to four log expansion in the patients. So this is searching for the, the sequence that's not in the normal genomic DNA, which is the foreign BB CD3 zeta fusion um, in, in, in the genomic DNA of peripheral blood cells. We found similar kinetics and um, trafficking in the bone marrow biopsies of, of patients so that cars both go to blood. They, we can show that they expand here in the first three weeks and then contract and, and remain in our initial patients now out past two years as, as memory cells in patients. Um, and then we can show that they are expressed on the surface of cells. So um, staining here in this case for CD3 cells in a patient two months uh, after the patient was infused. In this case, 27% of the cells were CAR T cells at that point, and that, that would be here at this point in this patient, and then later they, they decay as in a natural memory response after, for instance, a viral infection or a vaccine. So there's a peak of the cells, and then they decay down to memory levels. Um, the PK of the cells is shown here now for the first uh, 10 patients where um, the magnitude of expansion in vivo has correlated with responses so that the patients with complete responses have, have uh, where the, the cars expand a thousand fold and get to more than um, 1,000 um, copies of the car transgene per microgram of genomic DNA and blood. Um, that would be above 1% of the cells. So it's, it's similar to what we see in a massive viral infection, such as uh, EBV or a cytomegalovirus, and a patient has an immune system and can respond. So it's a monoclonal expansion of cells against CD19 because of the antibody. We've sorted these cells and find that they're both CD4 and CD8 cells, but they evolve over time in the patients so that 
the predominant cells that persist, persist in the patients are CD8 cells expressed in the car, and they're uh, highest in frequency in the bone marrow rather than blood in, in every patient we've looked at. In the patients who haven't responded, we have not seen the expansion of the cells in the patients. Um, and um, whether this is a property of the tumor or, or of the T cells or both is something that we're investigating at this point. Um, and this shows that um, the, the cars do expand in patients, and they cause an expected toxicity, which is B-cell aplasia. So these, this is staining of, the first, of two of the initial patients treated with CD19 and CD20, and these were leukemic cells in the blood so that there's a lot of those, as you can see. And at 18 months, we have empty boxes. So there's no normal B cells and there are normal, no leukemic cells. Um, and so that's different than if patients had had rituxan therapy where the B cells would come back. So here there's a long going, ongoing B cell aplasia that's profound, and the, and the patients are on gamma globulin replacement therapy um, that's, that's guided by serum measurements of their uh, immunoglobulins to prevent infections. We've had two infections. One, one patient was sinusitis. He had baseline sinusitis. And the other was in a pediatric ALL case where the patient uh, got influenza and was hospitalized. Um, so we can't vaccinate the patients and get an antibody response. So that's um, a uh, predicted toxicity that's on target because CD19 is on normal B cells, not on plasma cells, but it is on B cells and, and then the B cell leukemias. So there are a number of ongoing questions uh, from this trial here and, and others, uh, such as why weren't these cells rejected? Um, we have used so far a mouse antibody that uh, anti-CD19 that, um, and we would have expected human anti-mouse antibodies to arise and reject the CAR cells. We think that this is just an example of where the T cells can induce tolerance because they've eradicated the B cells and then the B cells can't reject the T cells. So it may be possible still to have T cell mediated rejection of the CARs. But these patients are very immunosuppressed because they've had, all have had fludarabine and have a significant, uh, impairment of their cellular immune response as well. So these results might be specific to this setting. Um, and um, we suspect that there's a relationship to tumor burden and then the dose that's required and, and as well as the proliferation of the CAR cells that occurs in the patients. But uh, we haven't yet been able to test that. Long-term safety of CAR cells uh, is, remains unknown. We know in studies that we've done in HIV that the CARs can persist for over, over a decade with uh, projected half-lives exceeding 16 years. So, so they last as long as natural T cells and perhaps longer, at least in the setting of HIV. And um, um, the safety then is established according to the US FDA regulations where they're on ongoing trials to assess um, um, for 15 years to look at uh, for the safety, in particular uh, because integrating viral vectors have been used here. So there's a potential for uh, you know, uh, genotoxicity due to, in our case, uh, uh, a lentivirus that was used to manufacture the T cells. And then this is, you know, CLL, as I showed, is an indolent disease. Um, what, what it, would CARs be able to work in a more uh, rapidly growing uh, malignancy, such as uh, acute lymphoblastic lymph, uh, leukemia? And now that we've had some uh, safety and efficacy in adults, we were able to start a trial in, in pediatrics using the same vector, So, and it's called our PD-CAR trial that's at um, Children's Hospital, and it's in pediatric pro-B-cell uh, ALL, or pre-B-cell ALL. And we have two patients that I can report on at this point um, with refractory ALL. The study is led by Stephen Grupp at Children's Hospital. And uh, the first patient was uh, a patient who had multiply relapsed ALL um, and did not have a donor for an allo transplant and could not be put in remission, which is a requirement for pediatric ALL for an allo transplant at our institutions. So she had multiple previous therapies for the, through Children's Oncology Group and then was given um, high-dose clofarabine and cytoxan in March and then treated on April 17th this year. So she's now out nine months from our therapy and remains in a complete remission. She had a significant toxicity that I'll highlight. Um, and um, she was given a dose of 10 to the 7th cars per kilogram. The second patient then, based on the toxicity we experienced in the first patient, was given a dose reduction and got 10 to the 6 cells of these CAR cells per kilogram. And that patient had was a patient who had relapsed after 
an aloe transplant, and then so she was a hematopoietic chimera. She was engrafted with a cord blood transplant that was sex uh, mismatched and four out of six HLA matched. Uh, both patients achieved a CR uh, after therapy. Um, the first patient is shown here, the kinetics of, of the response, um, and, and it was the, the T cells were infused over a day, uh, period of three days. Um, and, and the patient was aplastic initially, so her previous chemotherapy had been six weeks before, and she had a total shown our, her total white blood cell count in red, and then ALC and, and neutrophil count in uh, uh, black and white circles here. And so what you can see is about 10 days after therapy, she had uh, neutrophils returned in the circulation, and also blast, the white, her lymphocyte count went to 4,000, and initially we thought that that was a return of the leukemia, but it turned out that these were CAR T cells. Um, and, and so you can see the magnitude of expansion here. It's an exponential expansion. The cells infused here and to go to more than 4,000 CAR cells per microliter. Um, and if you calculate blood volume, you can see that there's been a tremendous expansion here within about two weeks after infusion. Now, she was very sick and in the ICU at this point. It was one of these Lazarus moments where she nearly died from cytokine release syndrome and tumor lysis syndrome. But the symptoms all followed this, these uh, that you'll see here, which were uh, um, on the kinetics of the lymphocytes appearing in the, in the circulation. Um, and this shows more graphically. She had two bone marrow uh, aspirates, one done on day six uh, after the infusion of the T cells, and one done on day 23. And staining here if in the bone marrow aspirate is shown for C19 and uh, and 20, so that four, uh, six days after the CARS, she still had about 50% of the cells in her marrow were blasts. And you can see those are gone uh, by day 23. And, and then there's been a reciprocal increase where the CARS have proliferated traffic to the bone marrow and, and correlate then both with the symptoms that she had, which I'll describe more, as well as uh, the eradication of leukemia. So she remains in, in re, uh, remission now, nine months after treatment. Uh, and uh, by MRD, by molecular analysis, there's less than one uh, uh, B cell per million cells in her bone marrow. So we cannot find any malignant clones in, in her at this point. So this is, that's the first patient treated where there's no chemotherapy given, the CARs alone. We're allowed to do, uh, you know, we're, we're able to accomplish that. Um, the second patient, as I mentioned, had had an ALL that was treated with an uh, aloe transplant, then she relapsed, and then was treated with blinitumumab, which is a bispecific antibody, on, uh, with two different dosing regimens of that and refracted to that. She was infused with um, in September 11th with, with a lower dose and then um, had a complete remission documented a month later. And um, so her T cells then were allogeneic, derived from her cord blood, um, and we could show that she was a chimera, her, uh, um, at the point when we harvested her and uh, did not have graft versus host disease, and uh, she did not have graft versus host disease with baseline, so that's a potential risk here. And, and we found in this case that the car is trafficked to the central nervous system uh, when she was tapped, uh, uh, and, and now we've actually found that both our patients have cars in the CNS. So these are the two cases I have shown you so far looking in the peripheral blood. The, of the trafficking of these cells and then in the cerebral spinal fluid when they're tapped. So we have less data points here. But both patients had peaks around 10 to 13 days after the cars were infused. Um, and a reference line here shows where the cells would be at 1% precursor frequency. And this is a log scale. So both of them essentially had 100% of their cells were cars um, at the point of uh, two weeks or so after infusion, and then they have uh, persisted as, as shown there. Because these were 100% uh, essentially here, and we could stain these by antibodies, a right stain uh, then at day 10 after infusion then statistically is this is what CAR cells look like. And the hematopathologists say they look like it's similar to what the cells that you see in, uh, in someone who has uh, EBV infection, say mononucleosis, the activated T cells. So they're, they're granular, large. Uh, T cells here. And in the cerebral spinal fluid, we see similar uh, uh, cells. Uh, all these cells were caused by genetic analysis and uh, no leukemia in the cerebral spinal fluid. Um, and they, they, again, on a cytospin, they have a similar morphology to what we see in the right stain in the blood. So the second patient, unfortunately, has not 
remained in remission by staining. This is staining showing CD19 on the CD45 uh, dim cells, which is where blasts were initially. And at a you know a month after treatment, she didn't have any CD19 cells, and she had a leukemia that was in remission. And but at 64 days after treatment. Um, she had, uh, not shown here, uh, a relapse with CD19 negative tumor. So we now know that in ALL, at least, that patients can have tumor escapes uh, when CD19 is tar targeted. So I mentioned the toxicities of B-cell aplasia um, and cytokine release syndrome. Um, in addition, they can have a macrophage activation syndrome. Um, the cytokine release syndrome is is uh, manifest really by high fevers and, and in the serum cytokines such as interferon gamma and interleukin-6. And I just want to highlight that we have found that in some patients it's refractory to steroids, high-dose corticosteroids, and but responds to tocilizumab, which is a cytokine neutralization therapy directed by using uh, tocilizumab, which uh, bind, uh, prevents IL-6 signaling. That's shown here in our pediatric patient where there was a biphasic fever curve, you know, fever going between 37 and 41 degrees here. So there's an FUO. There was no infection. This was due to cytokines, which, which we found uh, later. And uh, when she was given tocilizumab, it responded, and, and she became afebrile. These are the LDH is shown here. Second patient had a very similar course with a fever, but did not have uh, and require the immunosuppression. Uh, the cytokines are shown for both these patients here. They peak at the same time as the fevers did that I showed you in the preceding slide. And the, and the major cytokines are interferon gamma and um, IL-6, um, and, uh, and then re they return to baseline. But you can see they go about a thousandfold of baseline. The same kind of pattern occurs in, in, in the patients with CLL so that both ALL and CLL can result in these cytokine syndromes. And this is a patient that David Porter treated where on vital signs, uh, the fever ranged between, you know, 100 to 103, uh, and then on day 10 after treatment, after an infusion of tocilizumab with no steroids in this case, the fever resolved and the patient uh, remains in a CR now more than six months after treatment. The, the, the re tumor rejection can be delayed, and this shows an example of this where We've had a patient have tumor lysis syndrome and the cytokine release syndrome 23 days after infusion of the CARs. And we've now had one as late as 51 days after the CAR T cells were infused. So um, that's, that's an issue if the patients are not close to uh, care. Um, and um, so, so where, where we are at this point is to complete this pilot study and then to have an ongoing study to try to identify the maximum or optimal biologic dose in this case, because we've had responses over a two-order of magnitude difference in the patients. Um, and the summary, just to show you here that what I've mentioned is that CARs do have potent and durable activity. Um, they have toxicities that are expected. We can we can see that they can be used in the setting with chemotherapy or without chemotherapy, and they have um, um, probably uh, the ability to uh, be used in other kinds of tumors uh, depending on changing this, the antibody targeting domains. So a number of people were involved in these studies uh, shown here, and I'd like to uh, thank you for your uh, attention. I'm, I'm sure we have time for a few questions. Uh, Yes. Carl, fa fabulous talk and tremendously wonderful Thanks. work, as, as you know. Uh, you mentioned the mechanism of release for the ALL patient who relapsed. Any uh, a, a mechanism of uh, 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 resistance. Anything known about the CLL patients who had persistent disease and only received a PR or those who might have relapsed afterwards? Yeah, so thank you. So at this point, um, We've not had C19 uh, escape, target escapes in the CLL patients. And so the patients that have relapsed, some of them have dimmer, or, or that have not gone into CR, some of them have dimmer CD19 expression. But they have not had target loss. And in, in, in the ALL case, there is uh, I mean, no CD19 that we can detect at all in, the, in, in that patient, although that patient does have the original B cell receptor mutation. Is there any difference in, say, PD-1 expression in the uh, uh, or PD-1 ligand expression after uh, uh, these patients have relapsed? So um, on the CARs or so the, there may be 
we don't yet know that on the blast cells and whether, uh, and in particular, whether they might have immunosuppressive molecules that can uh, veto some of the effects of the uh, of the cars. And and you know the uh, the phenotype of the CAR T cells is that of sort of, of an effector memory cell. Thank you. Okay. Carl Schlomczyk. Oh, Carl, great. Amazing work. Do you have any Thanks. information about the uh, clonality of the cells that expand? I mean, you infect a, a big gamush of cells either by integrants, information, or by uh, uh, TCR sequencing. Yeah, so, um, so Warren, the initial, um, if, if the patients have had, you know, the kind of kinetics uh, over two to three weeks with expansion, we have sorted those cells and found that you know they're both CD4 and CD8 cells, and, and the T cell receptors are uh, polyclonal. Now we've had one case that that uh, I haven't had sh time to show where the patient had you know uh, an expansion 51 days after the T cells were infused. That was a result of one CD8 T cell, one TCR. So it expanded late, and then but uh, and, and then tumor went away, and then those cells went down into a memory level. So. Um, we've seen both when, when the so we believe the initial expansion is driven by CD19 in, in most cases, uh, and then then they do go down when target goes down. Carl, um, real quick, Alex Kong from Case Western, back here in the front. Um, can you comment on the chemokine receptor expressions on the cells that uh, that you put in the patients, and in particular CCR7, and uh, and whether or not you think the traffic into CNS is somewhat related to homeostatic chemokine reception, uh, receptor expressions, or just a permeabilized weapon barrier in general? So, um, so we don't know the mechanism of how, we, neither patient that we've seen that where we found these cars uh, in the CSF uh, had detectable uh, uh, leukemia, you know, via standard testing. So they were not thought to have CNS leukemia. So we don't know whether this was antigen-driven targeting in the CSF, and we don't know, for instance, the chemokine receptors and, so, and blood-brain barrier status. Um, so we, we, um, we're investigating that, and we believe in some cases uh, that it can be antigen-driven. Uh, we have a subsequent patient where they have, a, have had a, a shunt in previous ALL there, and the cars have also trafficked. So there's probably multiple mechanisms. What we found in both cases is that the cars have persisted in the CSF um, when when we can't find tumors. So there may be just trafficking of the cells there, and, and whether it's antigen-driven, we don't know. We do see that in our mouse models of uh, ALL, where we have uh, xenogenic uh, xenografts in, in humanized mice. There, trafficking of cars is is dependent on C19 antigen. So we'll take two more questions, Dr. O'Reilly, and then one here. Yeah, Carl, terrific talk. Thank one you. question also that would come up would be when these um, T cells go in and induce this B cell aplasia, uh, the concern would be do these cells also have the pa capacity to, as it were, induce uh, d uh, damage to the nearest neighbor, that is the niche in which the B cells grow? Do you have any data looking at the germinal centers in these uh, late afternoons to, to see what goes on? No, so um, so that's a great question, Rick. Uh, these patients, in in some ways, you know, the patients with CLL have really are really immunocompromised to begin with and have not had any thymic regeneration. So they've become, in a way, almost like skid mice, where they don't have B cells or T cells. And when you look at their peripheral lymphocytes, they're, they're NK cells, basically. So... Um, and, and lymph nodes, and we haven't been able to biopsy, but I am, you know, quite certain that um, there probably have both B and T cell, you know, aplasia there. So what's left it would be not the natural lymph node uh, architecture. Sophie okay, Pachesny, uh, so what are your thoughts on uh, suicide genes on the cars? So, so that's a great question, and that's where where I think the field is headed. So. There, and there's an issue that's, you know, the reason I think allogeneic transplants work for long term is there's a long term allogeneic effect that prevents leukemia rejection. So we don't know when you have an autologous effect how long you need to have this and whether one could eradicate these cells and then, then with them, you know, certainly then B cells would come back. We believe that's going to happen in our pediatric case. Uh, the first one out is at the age where the thymus now should regenerate and make a new repertoire. What we don't know though is, you know, is there an ongoing anti-CD19 uh, mediated effect? Uh, and 
or, or could there be a vaccine-like effect that could be driven by other specificities? So I think that's what the field will be able to try to accomplish next.